morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining Strauss and Company today um, for the um, next round of our installments. We're getting to um, sessions four and five um, uh, on, on highlights on our upcoming uh, May sale, um, in, in, which is with catalog sale. Um, and we are joined uh, by Sean O'Toole today um, in, with, in discussion with uh, three contemporary artists, Sanal Achenbach, Jake Aikman, and Georgina Gratschek. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Whoopsie. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today um, and giving us uh, your time. And um, I'm at this point. I'm going to hand over to Sean on the stroke of four. Sean, thanks so much for for joining us today. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks to Strauss for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I've watched a couple of Zoom and Instagram live meetings, and I realize it's all about optics. So all of this. It's actually a neighbor's house. Um, you know, one has to cultivate the look of importance. This is not true. Um, there's also other things that I've realized from Zoom, and I'm going to put the question straight out there immediately. If, I'm going to dispense with, um, I suppose, formalities. But we know this is a Zoom meeting. It's technically a panel discussion, but let's just jump straight in. So. I'm, I have socks and uh, slip slops on. <laughs> what are you guys? How are you? Because we can only see your upper bodies. We know people are cheating. Birkenstocks. Okay. Who's How are you? <laughs> so you're in short, Jake. I'm in shorts. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I got you, everyone. Yeah. What are you wearing, Coach? Oh me, um, okay, I'll stand up. Um, I've got my crocodile flip flops on. Oh, very nice. <laughs> okay, so we've established the tone. This is highly informal. Um, sure. On up here, like I thought, I'll be true to what I've been wearing every day. Okay, well, you're not in pajamas. That's the most yeah. important thing. <laughs> anyway, I mean, my question's really one of we're in an extraordinary time, even if we're making light here. Um, how, how are you? What are you doing in this lockdown period? So let's go to George. Um, hi, Sean. Um, well, as you can see, I'm in my studio, which you've been to numerous times on sort of uh, happier times, maybe. Times when we could visit each other. Um, so I've got a studio at home, so not much. I suppose my day-to-day -day life has changed. Um, I suppose just, uh, yeah, less visitors and more sort of um, working out what one's meant to be doing in the world. Um, <laughs> um, as you can see in my little corner, I've got a, been kind of busying myself with the self-portrait a day series, um, which has kind of proved to be, who knows how long that's going to go on for if I've got a big, <laughs> big enough studio for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may have a 365 day project, you never know. Well, exactly. I'm like, God, what have I started? <laughs> <laughs> and you, Nell, you're sitting in the kitchen, right? I'm in the kitchen, yeah. Ironically, this is probably the space with the best Wi Fi reception. So, um, it's sort of you, your day starts off with trying to have some routine. I've got two young kids, and we now have to start homeschooling, which is at a hell on wheels but um we try to to sort of get that done early in the day so that the afternoon i can still do my own work um before the lockdown i actually ordered quite a few canvases i had a, a couple of projects in the pipeline which has now disappeared but it's sort of it yeah it's a great distraction to keep on working and to just carry on what you were doing before and who knows how long this is going to be for or what the outcome is going to be or but it's just that kind of routine that's important and not to watch too much BBC and CNN and Al Jazeera and just, yeah, having a little bit of a routine helps, I think. You know? yeah. um, I'm locked out of my studio, which is in Woodstock and I'm in gardens. So um, it's been initially a sort of welcome break, I think, from the pace of working towards projects, art fairs and things like that. Um, I was sort of, I had a lot of big canvases on the go and a couple of weeks from now I was meant to be in New York with an art fair there and obviously that's completely out the window. So um, it's been 
difficult to adjust to not being able to work how I would. And I've attempted all works on the kitchen counter at the desk and um, it's not going well. <laughs> With, uh, to, to Sanel and Jake, both of you have, let's call it remote studios. Is it important mm -hmm. to have the space separate from your uh, living or home environment? It's absolutely crucial for me. I can't work at home. I've tried it. It doesn't work. I, I need my fixes. I need my loud music. I need my plants. I need solitude. I can't, fix, I can't work from home. I mean, I've tried. It's just, it doesn't happen. And I get distracted and I've got people calling me and want to be fed and, you know. <laughs> you, Jake? I think similarly to Sanel, but minus the children, but um, I, need, I need that space. That's my own, I guess, um, that I kind of prepare and work at for, I spent the better, past of, uh, better part of the last year preparing my studio to get it to the sort of optimal stage it's at now. And it's, you know, I just find it completely impossible to try and get that going in the space I'm in now. Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying too hard actually to, to work. <laughs> I know with writing, if I go away for a while, you lose fluency and it takes a while to kind of get back into it. Is that something you, you have particularly with painting that you feel? So now uh, you. Absolutely. But I mean, my, my work is I work with sculpture and painting. So those are two different parts of your brain. So for sculpting, it's a, you know what the outcome needs to be and it's a whole process of getting there. My painting evolves and all the time. So for me, that is a very particular mindset that I need to focus on and tune into. And this kind of disruption is difficult. It's difficult to get into that mindset and tune in. Georgina? Um, what was the question? <laughs> well, you're not listening. <laughs> I was listening to the response, but I was talking about um, studios working remotely, and I thought no, I no. to that if, category. If, if you have a break, do you find that it takes a while to get back into the groove? Oh, yeah, no, definite, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, but do you, and break, do you mean like what's happening? Like no, no, no. So, for instance, say uh, recently you went to the Armory show in New York. Admittedly, it yes. was under extraordinary circumstances because you had to get out of Dodge, so to speak. But I mean, yeah. it's a break from your studio. Do you find when you come back to the studio that it's, it takes a while to get back into the groove of working? Yes, definitely. Um, but I think for me, they kind of, it's very sort of welcoming sort of breaks. Um, and it's also important. I think once you've completed a project, like, like for instance, doing Armory, there, there's a lot of work and over, not that there's ever such a thing as overtime, but, you know, often it's weekends and you kind of push your whole life aside to make sure that you meet specific deadlines. And, and then I think it's important to, um, not be feeling like you're running a marathon and kind of get into a sort of more workable pace, you know, initially um, after the completion of a project, it's important to, if you can, acknowledge the fact that you've completed something and let it kind of build pace again, you know, or mm -hmm. that's how I work, yeah. Jake? Yeah, I was just thinking about what George was saying now and I thought actually there was a lot of pressure and work that, that I put in towards Cape Town Art Fair and I think, this sort of cancellation of going to studio or the upcoming projects has sort of gave me a pause, a chance to rest. Um, and I found I was actually really exhausted. Um, exhausted from the news of what's happening, but also physically and, and mentally exhausted from pushing. And I think riding adrenaline over that February period. So it's yeah it's also on the upside i've had a rest but um now i'm kind of itching to get back to work and struggling to kind of do things at home um mm. with other materials that i'm not used to and finding that tricky could i put a question to all three of you um, one of you georgina's in her studio and, and as georgina hinted at it's a very gregarious space people go visit there but you are all you're in, your partners are artists, you're involved in the art world, you visit other people's studios. Um, 
when you go to another artist's uh, working space, what particularly interests you? You don't have to name uh, an artist, for instance, but just, you know, when you see how other people work, what, what type of things do you look at that you notice? Who's first? So now you <laughs> put... <laughs> In the old days, I used to go straight for the CD collection and see what they listen to when they work. <laughs> now it's iPods and, and Spotify and stuff. So I, I look at... I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big snoop. I don't want to admit it. I love seeing what, what sketches, what's on the walls. Do they have a wall with with references or what kind of books are they reading? What's like, what's hidden beneath the books? Sketches, do people still sketch? I don't sketch anymore, so do people still have sketches when they plan their work? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big snoop. Mm -hmm. I don't mind, just leave me for an hour and then we can talk after, for sure. Mm -hmm. Georgina? Um, God, I was trying to think when was the last time um, I kind of did a studio visit or someone else. I do feel a bit kind of out in the woods here. I mean, you know, Cape Townians, if you have to like go over the mountain, you might as well pack an overnight bag. So, I mean, <laughs> um, in terms of, yeah, I think there was a point more like when I was sort of in like Maitland and sort of sharing space in the Atlantic house, I was definitely kind of more involved um, and sort of engage with other people's practice. And I kind of, yeah, it, it, it's sort of, um, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's always endlessly fascinating. And it was less about these spaces. I kind of like knowing everyone's different like routines and rituals and like who likes to chat um, for three hours in the kitchen and have a coffee and who waits till there's no one there and runs in to make a coffee so they don't have to have that chat. <laughs> You know, that's kind of interesting. And who comes like and works at three in the morning just so that no one else will definitely be there. You know, there's all those sort of different nuances of how people work and how they organize, you know, their time as an artist. Um, and that I find really interesting. But no, I mean, it's kind of strange at the moment. Well, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, who knows when we're going to visit studios again. But um, it's also something I kind of feel a bit out of touch with at the moment, sadly. Yeah. Let's all visit each other's studios when we can visit each other. <laughs> <laughs> Jay? Um, I think I think I'll add something a bit different to what they said. That I think I look at how I'm fascinated how people orientate themselves physically when they're painting. So I look at the height of their palettes, where it is in position to the painting on the wall. Um, those are the things I think are very important to me how I kind of create ergonomics in my workspace. So I'm always fascinated with how other artists do that. Mm. Yeah. So now you, you mentioned music. Um, both you and Georgina have made playlists for art uh, in during this lockdown period. And you. Uh, and me. <laughs> this conversation's about you. <laughs> Could you talk a bit to all three of you about your, I mean, you're all passionate about music. Uh, Jake briefly even DJed. Mm. Let's start with Jake. <laughs> Let's start with DJ Jake. <laughs> I, I, I dabbled for a minute, but I, I mean, I didn't really. Uh, become where, did a, you, where did you dabble and where was it publicly dabbling? <laughs> publicly, I think uh, maybe at, on Long Street at a couple of bars. <laughs> in 2005 or something. Well, I remember because we were students together. I think we we're like in fourth year. Sweet. Yeah, I had a, I had a vinyl collection for a time um, with quite a, an eclectic mix of things that didn't, didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Chanel, I mean, you've, you've made work about music. Um, and it's such an important part of, I suppose, even your practice. But could you talk a little bit about your interest in music? Um, I suppose a lot of the punk and what was happening in the Hacienda in the early 90s, that really fascinated me. And it's only something that I got to know in the mid 90s when I started studying at Stellenbosch University, because I grew up in Worcester. There were 
there was absolutely no nightlife. There was one music stall. Um, but that whole idea of, of the, the reminiscent of punk and when grunge kicked in, which I think is so lacking in what people are listening to nowadays, um, that whole resistance, it was our resistance in the 90s, the, the Joy Division and New Order. And so that kind of music is, is very reminiscent for me of that time, that we were the first of our state, first um, new um, dispensation um, generation. And that was the kind of music that, I think that kind of freedom of, of experimenting that, that's quite lacking at the moment. And you're right, I did an exhibition in 2011 at Blank Gallery called um, Some Dance to, what? what's it called? Some Dance from, to Remember, Some Dance to Forget. And a lot of it had to do with album covers of the time that I was listening to, so there were quite a few references to Peter Harvey and to Joy Division and Tom Waits. And I did a lot of prints and paintings of those album covers and that formed the majority of the works for the show. Georgina? Um, about work, I mean music currently or um, yeah. music relation to my work. You play a lot of music in your studio, right? When you work. Um, currently I listen to the BBC iPlayer because, you know, I, um, I think it's nice to, I mean, at once, you know, to not have to curate you know content for yourself and there's something kind of nice I listen to a lot of BBC Radio 6 which is sort of a music um, radio show which sort of doesn't play the obvious things um, yeah and I kind of enjoy the banter and the you know finding out new things um, and I also listen to a lot of like um, yeah radio shows like Desert Island Discs I enjoy and um, yeah, I'm listening to a lot more radio at the moment. Uh, that's kind of what I feel. Not, not so much Cape Talk because I did go through a Cape Talk phase and then <laughs> Matthew wanted to know, like, I think my depression was just deepening by the day. So now I've kind of have to do like very measured stints of Cape Talk and then counterbalance it with other things. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um. All three of you, in your different ways, have a partner that is either an artist or involved in the art world. One of the complaints of lockdown, not only in South Africa, but globally, is cabin fever. So even when you look at playlists, uh, there's songs that come up that are called cabin fever. Um, it's a bridge, though, to a question around being in a uh, a relationship where art is very much a part of it. Um, what are the benefits and what are some of the downsides? <laughs> I go last. Public, let's, let's just speak only about the benefits. So, so now you, you, for instance, your partner is Brett Murray. I believe so. I actually haven't seen him for a while, so if it comes a while, I'm just asking. I'm joking. Um, I think with Brett and myself, we've got a very unique situation where our studios are next to each other and we live together. So we kind of see each other all the time. Um, and thank fuck it works. I mean, we're lucky in that sense that we, 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 we give each other space. I, I don't sit on top of him and if he needs my advice on anything, he knocks on my door or if I need him to shut up, I lock my door. Or So we, we live together and we work together, but we, we're very, very conscious of giving each other space. So I think that is, that is very important. I don't know where he is now, so. <laughs> Regina, do you ever ask uh, Matthew to reprise his role as an art critic and come do a studio visit? <laughs> he wishes. I think he, I think he like, solicits a lot of, um, sort of not always appreciated advice. And um, I think he likes to wear that hat sometimes. Um, no, but I mean, and, and honestly, it's actually, we, you know, I think the conversations we have are kind of, um, yeah, during the day, I think we kind of leave each other alone. I mean, now even that he's working from home, um, you know, my studio is very separate, which I do enjoy. And I think he's learned from the past not to just come and, and, and lounge on my couch. Um, um, and actually currently he's helping me as a, an, a few hours here and there as a studio assistant and he's learned how to stretch paper for me. And he's- Oh, he's um, 
Awesome. Making them so beautiful. Yeah, well done. Awesome. And there's a lot of other things I could say, but I'm being nice. Yeah. <laughs> right, your, your partner, Alexandra Karakashian. Yeah, we both we're both locked out of our studios, so it's trying. But I think it's really, I think as a plus having someone who's in the same boat, um, who can empathise, and we discuss going through that together. So I think that's really, that's been really helpful. We both trying to make work on the dining room table, on the kitchen counter, um, things that we aren't sort of putting too much importance or value into just doing as exercises and just mm -hmm. trying to stay sane us and in touch with, with making things. But um, it's good to be able to discuss with her the ins and outs of, what we're going through as artists, I suppose. That's been really good. Positive. Yeah. Regina, do you want to chime in? Um, no, I think I've had all I need to say about Matthew for today's discussion. <laughs> <laughs> You're just always trying to get more info, Sean. <laughs> I'm, I'm haunted by that uh, phrase brass tax we have to get down to it so let me do it in a kind of <laughs> oblique way um all three of you have work on the forthcoming strauss and co sale um two of you are right at the end of the sale georgina and jake and sanel is in the penultimate session um, oh, wow. what's interesting is if you look at the catalog as a kind of greatest hits of South, of South African art. And, um, the reason I mention that is often when I, I interview um, South African painters, I'm, I'm struck by the references outside of South Africa that artists are looking at. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I think painting, unlike photography, is not strictly an image. It's also a method, it's a material, it's something you have to get close to. And all, we live at the end of the Northern Line here, we in Morden, in, in Cape Town. And um, we, have a, we have a painting tradition. It's an important one, but also a curious one. So that's a lot of padding. Here's my question. Um, in terms of South, and it's not a question about influence, it's really about South African painters, historical painters, rather than living ones. Who, who are painters that have caught your eye? You may not like them fully, but there's just something about what they do or did rather that interests you and you would, uh, you would pause to look at the work if you saw it. So I don't know who wants to pick that first. Raise your voice. I, I don't mind. Okay, Jake. If no one else minds, I was having a look at the catalog too, and I, I stumbled across that a Walter Battis, I don't, um, figure in a Hadramaut cityscape, and it's. Um, I think I've been looking at his work for a while, and a lot of other South African artists, without kind of, saying this is an influence or inspired me, but something that, maybe relates to what. The work that's on auction um, and to what you were saying about places outside of South Africa. Um, those particular works of mine that are from 2014, I think, um, followed a trip to El Salvador and Nicaragua. Yeah. And was heavily influenced by the kind of colour there and, and nature there. And I think if I look at his painting and, and mine, is sort of doing something that goes I do is get the, the the feeling of that heat and color that sort of went through the entire work. Um, Alexa and I were watching, binge watching um, the Ozarks the other night. I stopped because I sort of became acutely aware that the director had dressed everyone in green. Um, <laughs> and the whole, the sort of green permeated the whole image and I think it reminded me of what I was trying to do in the paintings to try and get that mood across. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or just gives some insight into that. Yeah. Georgina? 
Um, now, um, who was I going to... Oh, I kind of also browsed through the catalogue a bit, and then I was glad I did because I would maybe have forgotten to mention him. And I don't know if it counts because um, he just only very recently passed away, but Andrew Fester was always a, quite a big, uh, not an obvious influence of mine, um, but definitely an influence. Um, I'm a big fan. And also growing up in Durban, that thing you're saying about like paintings, you really having to be things that you see and sort of experience. And you no, know, Durban wasn't, I mean, Durban has had its cultural heyday times, um, but in terms of like thriving art shows and I didn't grow up, I mean, I was in high school there. I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a small town, but I mean, they're, they're, I wasn't going to gallery openings or, I mean, really attending. The, uh, the, I mean, there are some good museums, but uh, yeah, I wasn't exposed to a huge amount of art um, in the flesh, you know, and I think seeing some of his works were really um, one of the first things that I kind of saw in real life that was made by South African was kind of just like, wow, I want to know more about that or who that is. And um, yeah, I kind of, um, I mean, especially like his fragile, is it the fragile paradise series? The, those sort of like very um, the beautifully sort of colorful landscapes. I mean, I'm not doing justice to them. <laughs> yeah, so, um, that's just one, yeah, sort of, and also the, because the, the, the relationship, I mean, he's also from Durban, um, so, yeah, and there weren't a lot of artists that are kind of even knew by name, so he was kind of like one of the first, I'd say, mm -hmm. yeah. So now in Worcester, when things of Jean Velt, but... Uh, <laughs> totally, I was just going to say, we were so deprived, we had Jean Velt and we had Hichen Odea, and that was, that was basically it. Um, Nothing that made my bum hum. But I would say the, the first time, well, I'm glad you asked this question because it's something that we neglect. We're so, we're so used to referencing national artists. But the first time that I saw Penny Siopas take paintings in the National Gallery, that must have been in the mid 90s, I was totally struck by the sculptural element to her painting, which um, I'm quite a late bloomer when it comes to sculpture, but for me that, that you could do both, that you could be a, a sculptor and a painter and that you could fuse it and build up rich textures and also the, that abundance and that sort of that sensory overload of those works were, were quite amazing at the time. I mean, if those were my, my yardsticks to compare it to Hugo Nodier and, and Jean Veltz, those cake paintings were extraordinary and I saw them for the first time. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to, and I'm staying with you, Sunel. Uh, mm. Matthew, if you could bring up the lot of Sunel's that's being a memento. That's from, if I'm not mistaken, your show, Atopia in Potchestroom, right? Correct. Yeah, that was in 2015. Um, I was the festival artist for Art Club Festival, which is in Potchestroom. And um, because it was a museum show, not a gallery show, it kind of freed me up to work and experiment in a completely different way. Up, up until then, I would say I was mostly a figurative painter. I hadn't done much sculpture. And I wanted to, to do something completely different. And what I settled on was this whole idea of Ikebana, which is a ritualized Japanese um, flower arranging for several reasons. Um, First of all, I, the word utopia means um, without roots or a kind of a placelessness. And at that point, I was really struggling with identifying as being Afrikaans, but not an Afrikaans, no. And also being an uh, artist for a festival where the whole the cultural festival's focus is on the Afrikaans language. And I thought that was an interesting idea of looking at, at my own identity, of, of being associated with a cultural heritage, but not, but not feeling that, not being wanting to be part of that. As I said, I'm Afrikaans, but I'm not an Afrikaans, no. <laughs> and that idea of the, of the cutting and the severing of, of the root. So I started, um, most of the works on this exhibition were paintings and I made sculptural hybrids where I would fuse organic and inorganic material like metal, brass plating, resin and wood. 
and a couple of paintings. And this is the only work that stood out. It was a, it's a photographic print, what you're looking at, it's not a painting. And what I did was I tried to assemble an Ikebana flower arrangement. And in the tradition of Ikebana, the spaces in between the branches, those negative spaces are very much part of the work. So it's not just about the rigid um, formality of the, of the structure of the flower arrangement, but also the negative spaces in between. So what you're looking at is in fact, fake flowers and branches. So all of that is plastic or fake. And I made the sculpture out of these uh, fake flowers and sculpture. And then I had it photographed. And as you know, a lot of my paintings work with the inverse image, the, the idea of a negative or a ghost-like image where the mechanical process of capturing an image of freezing it in time is very much part of, of what you want to look at. So what you referencing the past and you also referencing you and your context where you view something in the present. And um, yeah, also as a printmaker, the whole idea of happy accidents where you have um, in the old days when we all used to work from film, where you have double exposures or glitches. And I like that idea um, of these accidents forming part of the final work. So you, what you're looking at is an inverse image of the double exposure of the sculpture, which is then printed out. It's quite a large work. I think it is about 160 centimeters by 110. So it's quite a large digital print. And I would say that it's an edition of three. It was quite a successful work, um, success that, that I was happy with the outcome of it. But very consciously, I've never reproduced anything like it. I've never done another print of a photograph of a, of a structure like that. I, I was just really happy with, it, with the outcome of it that I've never reproduced anything else like it. A, a technical sense. question, did you yeah. have in post-production? Yes. Did, did you do color matching to... Absolutely. The I'm a painter. That, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely, color, color is everything. So for me, that the sort of the ghostly use, and I wanted to reference the, the same color that you would have in x-ray. So it's those mossy greens and ghostly use of blue and dark. So there's no black in that per se. There's a lot of cyan and, and darkness. So Thank yeah, you. we did a lot of post-production and color, color palettes, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to jump to you, George, but it's a question that um, I'm first going to quote Jake. So you're not totally at rest there, Jake. Um, you told me last year that since 2013 about your main um, colors are French ultramar ultramarine, burnt sienna, sap green, and then very occasionally Prussian blue. That's correct, right? Correct, yeah. So be before I hand over to George, what are your main colors, Sanel? Mine is mostly cyan. I actually use quite a lot of lemon yellow and paints gray. So that, that sort of combination is standard. Okay. Georgina, your colors. I mean, you're a colorist. I, I was told that at a conference. <laughs> Oh, you were told that at the conference. Well, then it must be true. Um, well, I can show you. I mean, I'm I'm doing it on my iPhone, so I'm not actually sure. Uh, yeah, walk what us around. Talking. Walk us around. Um, yeah, my studio is looking abnormally sort of tidy, actually. I haven't been doing oil painting since this all happened. Let me see if I can work out, hold on, um, how to do the... Um, oh, wow, hello. Okay, there's my... But now I can't see what you guys are seeing. Can you see my... We're seeing your forehead. <laughs> oh, oh, how do I do that? Okay. There we well, go. Yes. There we go. Uh, okay, there. Okay. So these are some of my palettes. Um, and then here's some... I actually haven't been doing much painting, oil painting. And then here's some boxes of paints. As you can see, I'm very organized. Um, <laughs> And here, where else is there? Oh, yeah, I've been doing mostly watercolor. So, and then I've got a big, that's paints that are going to be used. <laughs> but I'm um, no, in terms of specific colors, as you can see from my palettes that, um, no, I'm kind of, um, or 
I don't um, discriminate against any color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew, maybe you can bring up um, crazy for you. Okay, let me try and now do this back again. Hold on. Um, Here we go. Ah, lovely. Hold on. Uh, can you? Oh, now I can see the screen. Sorry, this is whole Zoom thing's quite new for me. Um, yes, I can see it. Super. So I'm gonna. Um, quote Jake again about himself. So perhaps people that don't or haven't been watching Jake very closely would have missed that he, he included figures in his earlier paintings. There were quite a number of figures actually, but over time the figures kind of got pushed to the side and out of the frame. And um, Jake, if I'm correct, you told me that the human figure is a source of narrative distraction. Or I, did people, say that. I think I said that. Well, people project <laughs> narrative onto a, a portrait, for instance, or a figure painting. It's like, who is that? What is their situation? Yeah. We can't help ourselves doing that, yeah. <laughs> George, I mean, do you invite those questions or is it just a kind of moral hazard of being a figure painter? Um, sorry, hold on. Um, now I've lost you again. Oh, there. Okay, you're back. Um, yeah. Do I invite the question? I uh, know. I think. Um, I think often I find. Um, no, I think that the. I think I kind of. Um, it bores me when there's too much of a resemblance in my works. Like I think it's boring if you look at someone and then they just like. I recently did a painting of of, of Boris Johnson, and it's kind of. Um, often if people immediately recognize who it is, they kind of, it prevents them from like looking at what it is, you know, there's that, oh, it's Boris, and then you yeah. kind of walk off, you know, so I think often the, it's, um, especially when it comes to portrait, it's nice to have that sort of not obvious recognition or something sort of that discombobulates that so that the, the um, that there is a sort of, yeah, because I mean, even now I did show a Boris painting at Armory. And we actually moved it by the third day because people don't look at anything else. They kind of were like, oh, that's Boris, ha ha. And then they, <laughs> that's it, you know? And um, it kind of seems like a bit of, um, yeah, a failure in some things, yeah. Jake, could you talk maybe about your early figure painting? I think I, I, I was interested in maybe positioning myself or trying to position the viewer in the paintings. Um, and then I, I re realized that there was what I was trying to get across was stronger without obviously stating that. So I think that's that was the turning point when the figure was yeah was like it's I said, important I suppose to to say that they were not figure paintings in the sense of like a portrait. You included figures in your landscape. Yeah, they were sort of placeholders. They were. Yeah. In, in a kind of the romantic tradition, if you like, a, a sort of Caspar or David Friedrich type figures. Um, and I think I was trying to emulate some of that mood. And once I'd removed them, I felt like the, it was more open to interpretation in the, in the same way that Georgina's sort of obfuscating the um, likeness. Um, it, it, I was trying to achieve the same thing, I think, um, moving the joy. I'm going to come back to you, Jake, but um, I still want to concentrate on Georgina, but I'm going to ask a question to Sanel, though. You sure. use um, photographs as reference for some of your figure paintings. Does that allow you to create distance that it's not just about someone because it's, it's a painting about a photograph about someone? Correct. So that whole idea of it being images of images <coughs> borrow a phrase from Luke Timons is very, very, very important to me. Also, I, that idea of, of moving away from the likeness of a personality in an identity, that's quite troublesome trying to focus on, on, on that identity of a person and trying to extract and, and add to it. So for me, I like the, that's why painting figurative works takes a very long time for me because there's a, there's a lot of erasure, there's a lot of, of, of 
of starting over and painting over and building up layers with, with um, glazes, trying to obscure that sort of identity. So what you do look at in the end, when I finally abandoned the work and I, I set it out there, is, is very far from where it started off. And you're always trying to, to use that masking and that obscurity, which adds to the work, quite mm -hmm. frankly. So, and a lot of my references, especially from my earlier works, um, the current works that I did last year were my own references, but before that, a lot of it is vintage and fines and flea markets and markets all over. I never source anything from the internet that's easily to obtain. So I kind of like the whole idea of the mystery of finding that image that, that sits off a trigger, either being a personal or something that's, that's relatable. That's, that's part of the work for me. That's part of the power of, of making of paintings figuratively, for sure. George, you're, you're slightly different in that you'll just uh, grab from the magazines that are lying near you and then begin to kind of riff on images, right? Georgina? Oh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, I am quite different in, in that sense, is that I think um, I, a lot of, yeah, it's, everything from Instagram. A lot of my source material um, is kept on my phone and I screenshot things and I, a lot of things start with You Magazine. I've been an avid fan for about three decades. Um, I don't know if one's a fan, but you know, um, it's something I kind of grew up with. And then at one point when I was younger, I think I was critical of my mother reading it and being like, why can't we have better quality magazines? But here I am <laughs> buying it every week. And, and, and I think I kind of like the, the ordinary sort of insight, like where else are you meant to find like celeb pages about South Africans? Like, I mean, I suppose everyone, then you've got the Hayes Canute and you've got all these different, but for, I suppose my back, well, yeah, growing up, it was sort of my, my reference point. Um, I mean, not just you magazine, but then I also kind of use, um, I kind of, I like the found image. I definitely don't go out of my way to, um, do any live sittings or yeah. you know um it's nothing of that i like the load the, the ready-made image the found object you know something that presents itself to you um even when i do people that i do know friends and things i prefer to choose images that exist already or how they've chosen to present themselves in a picture and kind of work from there rather mm -hmm. than impose your whole from the beginning, impose yourself on this other person, if that makes sense. You, you mentioned uh, painting your friends. Um, I think about a year ago at Strauss, they sold one of your portraits of Ed Young. Um, yes. I've seen a portrait, I think, of Matthew. There's one of, um, help me out, because you've done quite a oh, few. I painted, I painted loads of my friends um, for various reasons. Um, yeah, I think there was Ed. There's been many of Matthew um, because Matthew's uh, around a lot. Um, um, Becky, I did a portrait of Rebecca Hayesum. Definitely, I did a portrait of Jody Paulson, um, who was my housemate for at one point in my life. Um, Ian Gross, Reshade Studios at at some stage. Um, yeah, I suppose eventually if you hang around with me at some point, um, I don't know, <laughs> there's going to be a pain. I probably, I mean, that's, I'm also maybe a bit, um, yeah, I suppose I kind of paint what's near me and what's close and what feels relevant um, um, somehow in my mix of, of things. I think there's even a painting of you, Sean, somewhere. Dear God, I'm not going to ask to see it. So the, <laughs> where, where did you see this terrifying dog that we all see? Uh, I'm okay. Are you? Is it, is it on your screen? I don't that's know. I was actually that. That's a very fictitious dog. Um, it's called God <laughs> Dog. I don't believe that dog could like sniffle at you. Never mind guard anything. I mean that that looks like kind of a. Oh, where's the screen now? I mean, I, it doesn't look like a very like a very vicious dog to to me. I mean, it's called God Dog. I think that was kind of more of a tongue in cheek. It looks like a Maltese poodle, as far as I'm concerned. Like you know, maybe sort of baring its teeth. Um, what else can I say about that work? Um, well, can, I, can I ask you, in, and I suppose it's a more serious question, in that you have been involved in, um, during the lockdown, in assisting dog shelters, am I correct? 
Um, well, you know, amongst other things, but yeah, I mean, I think it, the, 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 we were sort of helping a lady who's doing a, a soup kitchen and she kind of, well, not helping, just sort of donating. But then she said um, how I was put in touch with her is because she said she was finding it heartbreaking and delivering soups. And like, obviously that there's so many people who aren't able to feed their dogs. So yeah, we kind of, there's many people doing everything. So I'm, I'm part of a group of people that are trying to provide food at the moment. Yeah, for dogs and for also humans. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I'm 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 always involved in about a million dog charities. That's me. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to Jake because I see the clock is marching. Um, this work, the island closer, is from 2014. Um, a year before, you had the trip to El Salvador and Nicaragua, and it was quite a it, the paintings that you showed that year marked a kind of shift into a different, maybe a mature phase, would you say? Definitely. Um, I matured a bit on, on after that trip, <laughs> maybe not during it. Um, but I think that's I sh that shifted more towards the green in, from a very blue-gray paintings of the sea to that green, which has stuck with me. And I think that was the first time that I started to really delve into it. Um, yeah, and with, with, say, when we were talking about the portraits, um, that <clears throat> they, there's a large degree of fiction, with the work, the island that we're looking at, is that a real geography or is it a fictionalized space? Um, definitely a fictional space, and maybe if that was part of that maturing you as you phrased it of feeling comfortable with just using ph photography as a hook um to you know to start out with a, with a painting and then um i felt very comfortable changing the landscape that went along and making things up um and and that series of paintings was the first time i did that with confidence i think um up until then I kind of, I, need, I was much more reliant on the photograph. And, and these ones, I was much more interested in getting a mood quality across. Mm -hmm. and then I would do whatever I needed to in the painting to, to do that and shape it how I saw fit. And then shift as well. I've got a question. Do you remember yeah. what you were reading at the time? Because that's a, this is a very special novelistic quality to these works. Do you remember? I think it, I think I ticked off reading Heart of Darkness at that point. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely. Um, and I can't remember what else. Um, I can't remember what else, but that was definitely something that. For that sure, you can see. George, Georgina mentioned you magazine, and maybe to lift the veil a little bit, you were surfing too. So probably there were some surfing magazines. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, you know, my my research trips were 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 surf trips. Um, it was a good formula for a while, and I think it might be difficult to get back to that. But I I feel like that's something maybe I should get back into. Um, I'm going to end on a question before throwing it open, and it's just a very broad one. Um, all these pictures have arrived on the secondary market. And my, my question is really one of, um, I think, starting out as an artist and beginning to get a sense of what you want to do, getting an exhibition, putting it out in the world and testing whether there'll be a response. So it's less about them being here, but they, that thing where the labor that you're struggling on and then suddenly finding that there's an appreciative audience. Was that a shock for you or is it a pleasure? Is it a relief? All of the above. <laughs> and now? Yeah, I always expect the worst. I always expect to find storage for everything afterwards. And when something sells, you think, wow, that was the last sale I'll ever have. So I don't know. Do you, do you uh, celebrate your sales? 
Do I what? Do you celebrate your sales or a successful exhibition? Every single one. I take the kids (laughs) to the spur, for sure. (laughs) Georgina? Um, Yeah, I always, I'm I'm also sort of nosy. I love knowing where paintings go. I love seeing them, like, like when I do know the collectors, I love seeing it in their homes. Like, I got a picture yesterday and I'm like, oh, it's so interesting where they put it. Um, so, I mean, not, I'm not sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always very grateful when they find a home and I'm always very curious to like, um, you know, w- what story they become part of, you know, like the works become part of someone else's narrative. And like, I mean, recently there's this, um, a sort of a collector in California who's, who bought a work recently and um, she's sort of doing this like lockdown sort of Zoom series every day. And she showed my work next to, an, uh, which is a portrait of a little dog. And she showed it next to um, a painting of a dog she had by Alex Katz. And she did this sort of talk about that. And I was like, that's so wonderful and amazing that it's, this work's got this other new life, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was quite jealous of its new life. Yeah. Blake, where have you seen your work hung unexpectedly with? Or who, should I say? So now you too. Um, for me, very specifically, it was not a painting, but a sculpture. My, my very first bronze sculpture was called Along the Shiny Road. It's a, 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 a pony, a black pony. And uh, this very specific collector uh, put it next to Claudette Schroeder. With this beautiful horse, white pale horse. And I was blown away because I studied with Claudette, but I mean, I was totally in awe of her work all these years. And to be in that same grouping for me was just, was just magnificent. But also in terms of geography, we being in South Africa, it's such a small pool and we kind of know a lot of the collectors who collect our work. So I'm, I'm quite sure that's very different if you're based in Europe or in America where you send your work out. We're here, it's wonderful to, to have a bit of context of where your work ends up and you sometimes know the people and there's a connection. For me, that's, yeah. that's very important in a way. Jay? It's, it's taken me years to kind of meet up with people who've bought paintings that I didn't meet initially when, when the sale happened um, and then f- meet them years later as a collector I met a year ago. And I think Georgina went to his house recently in upstate New York. And our work is hanging together there. And I didn't know that until you know, sort of 10 years after the, the exhibition happened. It's oh, nice right. to, to find out those things, yeah. Could I ask Matthew, are there any questions? Um, no. Yeah, so super. Th- um, thanks so much, Sean. Um, I'm just going to come back uh, <laughs> Come back here. I've um, been, very, been very quiet in the corner. But um, thanks. Uh, thank you so much to... Um, to 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 um, uh, the artists for joining uh, for joining us, um, and I'm going to open to the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if uh, uh, there would be any questions um, that you'd like uh, to to direct, um, uh, perhaps on any of the any of the lots or anything that we've chatted about or anything that you'd like to share, please feel welcome to share those in the chat. We've got about five more minutes. Um, in the meantime, I'm since, just going. Since there's four of us. Um, Four is a good number. I've asked enough questions. Do one of you three want to pose a question to someone? Let's interview Sean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask Sean what his lockdown strategy is. Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. What are you working on, Sean? Um, I'm currently at this minute behind on deadline for a new Feiden book, um, uh-huh. one of their vitamin books. This one focuses oh, wow. on drawing. Nice. And um, <clears throat> I, got, I got assigned a couple of artists to write about. And there are South Africans in it, pleasingly. So, no, that's amazing. That's great. And then I signed a contract to do a small monograph on Irma Stern. Um, oh, wow. Which was Isn't a big one? Pardon? Isn't it a big monograph? Well, it's for Prestel in Germany, which is um, a <laughs> good title, <laughs> a publisher. It's decent, it's decent, yeah. Um, That's all right. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, there's that famous urban cowboy scene where Dustin Huffman shouts at a car that bumps into. 
we work in here. Yeah, we work in here. Sure. <laughs> so there should be one question from, is it Terry, Matthew? Yes, I see Terry Brown. Hi, Terry. Um, uh, is the, she's, um, she's saying, uh, hello, babe, how are you finding this? I think, Terry, that might have been a, intended for a, a private chat. So, um, <laughs> but uh, we, we're finding it, finding, it, oh, finding it wonderful. So thanks so much, Terry, um, for joining us. Um, what did, I think I've got, a, I think I've got a, a, another, another question um, just for, um, uh, uh, just for the, for the artists and I suppose in, in light of Sean in, interviewing you, what a, post the lockdown and um, you know, I think it's important to sort of figure, figure, life, figure life in the studio. What are, what are projects on, are there, are there any projects on the horizon? What are you guys looking at to sort of reconceive um, plans that were, were, were laid pre-lockdown? Do you guys have anything, anything going? Mm -hmm. Who's first? So now, um, I was actually meant to be on two art fairs this year, and as far as I know, I am still on two art fairs this year. That's late. That's going to be in October, November. That hasn't been called off. So, but regardless, I just carry on with the work that I started. And listen, if the lockdown ends this year, if it locks down ends in 2022, we don't know. We just have to kind of carry on. Mm. So I. For me, it's about the work and, and finishing the actual work. I'm very interested to see what the focus is going to be during this process. How, how will that shift? Because obviously we have this momentous climate change and we're going to have a lot of deaths in this country and a lot of poverty. And surely that's going to have an impact on our, on our work and our output. So I'm, I'm hesitant and it's, it's quite exciting to see what's going to be happening next. But um, for now, it's, it's carry on, carry on, for sure. Um, we, just, uh, we just got a question, and I suppose this is, a, this is quite a practical question. Looking, I suppose, at this point, as, as Sean asked, you know, how it's, you know, you've, you've made work, you've had exhibitions, and now the work, it comes sort of full circle for another life into the secondary market. Um, as starting out, how is important to, um, to, 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 have exhibitions in creating your oeuvre. Um, just uh, we're asking for my mum say uh, Gloco, um, and she said, "What are one of the key things that you need to go um, uh, go about it?" So, what do you know when you when you're planning an exhibition or when you're conceiving of putting a body of work together? What are some of the core things, I suppose, um, that you that you look for as a point of departure? Just a, yeah, just a sort of a, a, a brief a brief sort of key into how you approach putting a body of work together? George? Um, um, I suppose that's kind of quite broad. I mean, I think it's maybe more, um, I mean, a body of work together. I mean, I suppose recently I've been doing more, more fairs, which is sort of putting together a smaller body of work um, and has sort of has different requirements. Um, but um, and I also, I mean, I kind of work and, and everyone works differently. I kind of work in a way where I don't have a sort of definite outline. I kind of make a work and it leads into another. And then my way of working is to like make enough work to maybe fill a small warehouse, but actually you've only got five meters and you have to edit everything down and try and like still have it that it's space and, and get things in there. So I kind of, my thing is to kind of, make too much often and then sort of edit edit down and try and create a sort of a coherence and a narrative through the objects you've made but um i know everyone works i mean it's very different for everyone how do you work jake i'm not sure well i'm i'm working all the time and there's always a number of paintings on the go so i, I kind of i suppose i try to tease out a thread that's leading me somewhere and i hopefully then that becomes body of work if if it's going to be a, a big exhibition which i haven't had for a while i think the same focused on art fairs um yeah that's been the focus lately but and i'm not sure if that will change completely um after this and what yeah. the relevance of having a big open public exhibition how that will change um and art fairs of course traveling and if that's going to be a possibility where we have to quarantine on both sides of the uh, round trip 
Um, those are the kinds of things I've been thinking about. And, and obviously, I think what Sunil was saying, just keep making work and hopefully it finds an audience. But I, the, where that audience will be, I think, is something intriguing. Jacob, uh, we've got one big question, but um, we've got, uh, before I get to that, we've just got another question sort of directed for you uh, from a, anonymous, uh, an anonymous uh, viewer. Um, and they're just saying, um, you know, one of the, one of the, um, only, uh, one of the places that your work has really seen a lot of prominence is through Strauss and Co. Um, on the, on the, you know, you've done quite nicely on the, on the contemporary sales recently. And, um, you know, far from being, you know, your, the, the, these works far from being sort of seascapes, they carry an internal, an internal sort of narrative of, of, shape and water and um you know your kind of relationship to, ship to it somebody was just asking could you could you speak about sort of how you how you approach um your your subject matter what is the kind of in, intimacy there i think it's you know in a way it's similar to the energy that's that we we present with the moment is sort of this huge uncertainty and I think that's what i try to put into the work so i mean Everyone has a different response to the work, but I always try to kind of create, uh, for the example, with the island, there's the island closer for me. It's like, well, are, we, are you arriving at this place or leaving the, this place? And I try to create that tension. Hopefully that's that's the aim with the work. So whether it's, whether there's an island or not, or whether it's a calm sea or not a calm sea, there's this sort of brooding uncertainty. That's I'm feeling that now. And sitting here listening to everything and what's what's happening out there and hopefully i can kind of tune into that with the work when i can go back to the studio i think if that answers your question so there's a, there's another interesting question um uh, interesting question i think for all of you because i mean i think we really this is where we at at the moment but they said um uh, selwyn was just saying um uh how do you feel about the heightened consumption of your work digitally? I mean, I know, you know, I've, I've heard uh, at least one of, at least one, one on the panel today um, say that, you know, everybody hangs out on Instagram. Um, you know, it's that's, you know, what, what, how important is social media to, to the way that you, that your work is mediated, seen, consumed, spoken about, liked, loved, shared, thumbed, et cetera. What do you, what do you, what are your kind of feelings? Who wants to go first? Sunil? I think it, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty new to Instagram, new-ish, about two, two and a half years. And I find it fascinating how people respond to certain works. And also it's a way of maybe recalling work that you've done a long time ago that you kind of forgotten about and putting it out there and then, and just seeing if there's response to it or not. And then, trying to in your in your current situation trying to relate and, and see how you relate to, to that work when you were making it so i find i find it fascinating absolutely mm -hmm. um, i mean i don't put a lot of weight on it it's not going to pay school fees but it's it's fascinating i know george, um, george eats uh, social media for breakfast so georgina um <laughs> no i mean i I think I think obviously I um I I I enjoy um being like even now I think it's nice like my little thing that I'm doing every day I think it's kind of quite fun to be able to like I don't know engage with other people and show you show people what you, what what you're up to and then, and vice versa I think I'd feel terribly isolated like even more so if I couldn't sort of like have snippets into people's lives and what they're doing and what they they sort of sharing um you know and i find like it's a wonderful springboard like someone comments something and then you have a conversation and that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise so um but at the same time yeah definitely i don't put like a huge amount of value it's definitely not going to pay my grocery bills but it's fun you know and it's and it's connect it's yeah how else are we going to be connecting right now and it's a nice way to discover new artists you know i've discovered a lot through through it i think yeah i mean jake you know just bringing that back to you um you know you did this project um in sure it must have been a couple of years ago now 
where you um, where you did, painted a mural um, on a wall in uh, where was it? in in Kiev in the Ukraine in Kiev in the Ukraine and um, and the only way that I would ever have uh, have have seen that I'm never going to be in Kiev for the foreseeable future. Um, so you know, and that the 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 way that and that's like the the that work has been geotagged and shared by countless amounts of people. Tell us a bit about that experience. It was it's just quite a cool quite a cool way of you know you know obviously murals work to do that, but um, it's quite a cool way of of um, of you know not only doing the work in situ but actually also of of sharing it and giving a place a kind of you know, you're giving a sense of place, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, are you connecting this to your social media question, or yeah, the, how the, how it was how it was the ability to share it and brought it to yeah, I mean, people? Yeah. I mean, if I'd just gone and done that without having Instagram and those and those platforms, that it, no one would have known about it, um, except the people there, obviously. But I mean, it was spread rapidly across Facebook and Instagram. And it sparked a lot of conversations and articles about it. And I think, I mean, it's, I think then I really took notice of the power of, of that platform, I think, after doing that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, can, I, can I pitch in a question to end? I mean, we have to, I think we've already broken the rule by going over right. five minutes. But it might sound ponderous, but it's not meant to be. Um, so it's a yes or no question to the three of you, because what we're having here is a kind of uh, digital um, forum. If this were in the real world, would you have agreed to come to sit on a stage and talk? No. <laughs> no. no way. No. Okay. Public speaking is maundering. It's, it's, I, I loathe it. <laughs> no, I mean, no. I'm worse than all. I'm worse than all. I would have had like definitely. It would have been very busy that month. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, so I mean, the, the, the reason I ask this is to sort of disentangle some things. What's happening here is happening in a very particular moment, mm. and it's one of connection and intimacy. But at the same time, you're also doing, or broaching attention in the art world, which if we take two figures, the one is uh, Duchamp and the other is Joseph Boys. Yeah. And Joseph Boys famously said of Duchamp that his silence is overrated. And there's a number of <laughs> artists, if we think of uh, in Cape Town, Jane Alexander, who famously won't be interviewed and are very guarded and close and protect their, their right to silence to not have to speak about their work um how do you i mean even though we're negotiating it by this way are you are you hesitant about sharing thoughts about your work and your life in public i'm i'm not uh, for me it's not the hesitancy i think for it's it's the physicality of it it's so much easier talking to four faces than talking to four faces but then uh, looking over your shoulder at a hundred more um, I must say, after the Spear debacle in 2012, I've become much, much, much more hesitant in sharing um, a privacy. My work is personal to me, and for me to discuss it, it's, it's, it's not a violation, but it's definitely something that I'm very aware of, that I'm sharing something very private. So it's, yeah, this is definitely, I mean, when we spoke to Matthew earlier, I had no idea that the Strauss talks at such an incredibly large platform and I think that's fantastic. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done this two months ago. So it's, I think it's incredible. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think, I think there's something about the informality of it. Um, I mean, I think if you hire a hall and there's Sean with a microphone and we're going to have to discuss the state of painting in post-apartheid South Africa um, during, you know, and, and then I think there's, and then and everyone has to drive physically in their cars to attend. And the pressure just sort of mounts up. And I think those sort of um, environments, no, I think I kind of, I think this sort of feels, it's like an informal, not informal, but I mean, it's been an interesting uh, conversation and I've enjoyed sort of hearing. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful conversation that wouldn't have happened otherwise, which is, which is nice. And I think, so also as artists, as I was saying, you know, I think it's sort of, um, 
yeah, I think that it's a sort of often artists aren't always sharing with each other also what's going on in the studio. And as you have shared sort of studio spaces and that, it's sort of nice to get this insight. For sure. Okay. Jake? Yeah, and I mean, I don't, I don't think I'd jump at the opportunity to be on a stage either. I think I, I like to let the work do the talking and sit back and, and listen. But I, I do feel comfortable being on, on this platform, having <laughs> you, Sean, who I know, and Matthew, to, to ask questions. So it feels, it feels natural cool. in, in a very natural circumstance. I'll end by saying thanks individually to Sanel, to Georgina, to Jake, to Matthew, to the 90 participants who stayed <laughs> after five o'clock. It's very important. I think it was important to end on a question about that thing of the artist's voice, partly because I do research work for Strauss. And one of the things that has struck me when one looks at artists 40, 50, 100 years ago is the absence of their voice in the archive. You can find um, reviews, so you can find opinions of what they did, but very rarely you find them just talking about common incidents in their life and then also about what they do. So, you know, it's, I always find it a privilege to speak to artists. It's not about a kind of holy moment, but it's a, it's a certain communion. And that's my Catholic ending. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, uh, thank you everybody to, uh, who joined us today. And I'd just like to remind everybody of the talk tomorrow. We'll be featuring Dendi Easton, British continental uh, sp painting specialist, um, speaking with Ian Hunter. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank Sean, you. And you well, thanks. Thanks bye. So much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye.